Hello again. This is part two of the of the Scythian connections and the DNA of the Scythians. And if West and East Scythians have the same DNA, So, uh, where did we stop? Uh, with Turkic languages, right? So they found out and they asked themselves some questions. Um, if the contemporary descendants of Western Scythian groups had the same DNA with the Eastern Scythian groups, um, and they found out that the Western Scythian groups are more in the Caucasus and Western Asia, sorry, uh, Central Asia, and the Eastern Scythian DNA is more found in the Turkic speaking uh, parts, especially in the Kupchak branch of the Turkish languages. That's what they said. Um, I already made my comment on the um, the linguistic part of it. Uh, it says here there are potentially many more demographic factors involved in the origins of Turkic language speakers, such as migration, waves associated with the Xiongnu, ancient Turkic or early Mongolian populations. The extent to which the Eastern Scythians were involved in the early formation of Turkic speaking populations can be elucidated by future genomic studies in the historic periods following the Scythian times. Um, yes, of course you have to dive into Turkish language and Turkic languages, and of, of course you have to look into the Xiongnu and Mongolian populations, but Turkish has, has not only derived in Mongolia and in the East, um, Turkish has its roots in all the step belt, the steppe belt. So if you look, um, if you want to study the roots of Tur the Turkish language, uh, you cannot only look at East Asia. You have to look at Ukraine. You have to look at Hungary. You have to look at Eastern Europe. You have to look at the Balkans. You have to look you have to look at uh, Central Asia, the, the Crimea. You have to look at the, the Pontic Steppe, the Caucasus. You have to look at... So I'm considering the, the map in front of my eyes. Where the Steppe was formed, there is the Turkish language. There you can see most of the, the Turkic languages spread. Um, yes. And even in the Caucasus, we have the, the Turkish language uh, spoken by the Azerbaijanis. So the the, the Azerbaijan people, they are also Turks, and most probably Turkish started from that belt, stretching until parts of Mongolia. Yes, I have to continue. So, sample material. Some skeletal samples were taken 
from Russia and Kazakhstan. They were selected um, and they analyzed 110 skeletal samples, it says here. Um, okay, they looked at 96 samples of uh, mitochondrial DNA. And a preparation was made. So from the PCR laboratories, etc. Uh, sample preparations uh, were taken, DNA extraction was made, and uh, mitochondrial DNAs were taken, etc. So it has been described how they made such an analysis and the mitochondrial genomes were taken and they were selected blah 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 um, amplification was performed and it was it was uh, compared if these reactions overlapped so and they found out that um let's see they found out that 37 mitochondrial dna samples um Anyway, anyway, this is the analysis, um, how it was all made and things like that. So purification steps, etc., etc. I don't understand that part. So the sequencing was carried out in Konstanz. Oh, in Germany. Okay. Um... The haplogroups, haplogroups were assigned haplogrep, blah, 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 etc., etc. So uh, analysis were made, right? And the coding fragments were made, etc., etc., independent reproduction. It was carried out, blah, blah, blah. And in the Russian cytology and genetics, this is important uh, because... I found out this article from a very good comment that I found uh, on YouTube and I wanted to have a look at this article. Um, so all results were concordant with results produced in the paleogenetics lab mines. So they were they were made in Germany. The the results uh, were analyzed in Germany, but they were carried out by Russians. So during the sample preparation process, blank controls were included in the pulverization extraction and amplification steps. Um, I'm leaving out the details. There were some reactions, some contaminations, etc. So how you analyze the pulverization. So um, biostatistical analysis for the population, genetic analysis. Um, certain samples were used, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Mm. What was the result? So analysis were made, analysis were made, blah, blah, blah. Uh -huh. Okay. The ABC analysis to explore 
the demographic history of the Scythians, we formulated multiple candidate scenarios, which provided the basis of simulating samples of genetic, genetic data for the HVR1 region using blah blah blah. Calculations of summary statistics of the observed data were, was performed to confirm the candidate scenarios we were able to reproduce the observed genetic data. We compared the prior con in, uh, con distributions of simulated summary statistics. All analysis were performed, blah, blah, blah. Okay, this is important, the genomic analysis. The DNA library preparation for subsequent shotgun sequencing was performed according to the protocol, blah, 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 with slight modifications for the shotgun samples to analyze the genomic data. Statistics were calculated. Analysis of ancestry streams was applied and an admixture analysis was performed. Well, okay, admixtures were performed, blah, blah, blah. Analysis were performed. What was the outcome of this? Uh, uh, okay. So this is actually how they made it. We found out. We found out the results, right? What are the results? The results are that the ancient North Eurasians contributed to the Caucasus, they contributed to the Turks, they contributed to the American Indians, to some Europeans, especially East Europeans, some parts of Central Europeans, not all, Russians, um, but uh, the Russians that were not, uh, mixed with Slavs, they mixed with the Slavs later, the, the Bulgarians, the Balkans, um, I also believe the West Asians and the East Asians, the Central Asians, definitely. So they had the most propor the, the, the most proportions in the Central Asians, of course. Um, who else? Uh, so most most parts of the world actually and these formed later on the Yamnaya but the Yamnaya are only one part of Europe um, but they are not Indo-European um, because the Indo-European languages, they have their roots, as I said, in the old Yenisean, uh, Ural-Altaic families. Um, and because Edward Wider has helped me in this research a lot, I want to thank him. And I wish that we learn lots of lots of data from him. So I think it has finished. That's it. That's it actually. So uh, this is my This is my result, actually, my, my presentation. Uh, I'm so happy that I found this article from nature.com.
I only wish that uh, people would... Oh, God. I only wish that people would uh, be very, very... Um, how can I express myself? Researchers, people, and the 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 people who who look at the family trees that they would uh, find the root better uh, instead of trying to overemphasize their own family trees. So what I think about the family trees is I always thought that there was a proto uh, in the European family which was connected with the Ural Altaic family. And I think I have found it. Um, it is the old vocabulary, the old family that was spoken by the ancient North Eurasians. I think they had a common language which had hundreds of maybe thousands of uh, Turkic words both in Western uh, Eurasians and in northern Eurasians because in western Eurasians we find uh, Turkic words and in eastern Eurasians we find Turkic words that means that all the step part stretching from Mongolia to Ukraine and to the Caucasus that they had um, a common language the reason why the Caucasus was not predominantly spoken uh, Turkic is because it was most probably uh, a little bit mountainous and those parts had certain features of the uh, Nadine um, family that is the um, how do you call it the hypothesis uh, the Nadine uh, Caucasus uh, hypothesis I guess it's called where the Atabaskan um, the Atabaskan actually uh, American Indians formed um, their family their uh, language family and the Caucasus still has these features these North American features um, so what I think is that the Yeniseian the old Yeniseian families they were all also formed in southern Siberia most probably in the same region in Kazakhstan and in the area of Kazakhstan. Um, maybe Sentashta, Andronovo, Afanasievo was also part in this and also Samara. And there um, the Yeniseian language also had its uh, mixture together with the Ural Altaic words, with the Turkic words, and they are most probably the descendants of the Indo-European language family. That's why we, we have so many Turkish words, so many Turkic words in Indo-European. Um, that's why we have a mixture of uh, 
the same roots. Later, most probably, uh, the Western, the Western families, they were under the effect of the Semitic, Semitic um, language family, and it changed. But originally, I think it was mostly the effect of the Ural-Altaic and the Old Yeniseic languages. So actually, uh, Indo-European, so-called Indo-European, is actually a, a mixture and a, a spoiled Uh, a spoiled language which still has some features of Semitic and Old Yeniseic Ural Altaic influences, which contributed mostly to the Indo European language. Because you can see it in uh, Indian, you can see it in the Middle East, that these features are present in Indo-European. So later they must have come into contact with these groups. Because if you look at West Asia, West Asia was uh, predominantly uh semitic later on um mesopotamia was under the effect of the semitic groups so most probably these yeniseic uh caucasoid people they were under the effect of the semitic languages and they spread it to europe in that way so there is no family tree, in my opinion, like Indo-European. It is actually the Caucasoid Nadine Atabashkan family that has become spoiled with the Semitic and Middle Eastern influences. And of course, with the Indian influences. Yes, that was my, uh, okay, that was my uh, presentation. Um, and if, if, if I want to mention Sumerian and Jules Oppert, um, Jules Oppert said that actually Sumerian. He wanted to name Sumerian Castosithian. Why Castosithian? Because Sumerian has influences from Scythian. Scythian was a Turkic language. It was not Iranian. It was not Persian. It was not an Indo-European language. Um, Sumerian has thousands of old Turkic words in it and these words are found in Chuvash, so in Hungarian. So this means that Sumerian was very much influenced by the Indian languages and the Semitic languages because Sumerian was spoken in the Fertile Crescent. So Sumerian was also um, a part which was partly spoken by the Yeniseic groups, most probably. Uh, it was Situ uh, it was inhabited by the Siberians, 
sorry. It was inhabited by the Siberians. Um, but later on, most probably the Indians and the Semitic people, they invaded those areas. And the language in this way got a little bit spoiled. I mean, it got mixed and influenced by the other language languages, yes. And um, <clears throat> Tocharian. Tocharian is not an Indo-European family. I now think that Tocharian is maybe the oldest branch of the Yeniseic families that was spoken in that area. But uh, it started to get spoiled by the Indian language. So uh, Indian most probably, so Southern India of course, or Southern Asia let's say, Southern Asia most probably had its effect on these Yeniseic language because you you start to see uh, Southern Asian influences in Tocharian. So Tocharian is a, a Yeniseic language. Most probably it had features of the Nadene Adabashkan and Caucasian features. Uh, it is a Siberian language. It's an, it's an old Siberian language. That's what I think about um, uh, Tocharian. Um, and about the phenotypes, I want to mention that the ancient North Eurasian phenotypes were not dark at all. They had very mixed phenotypes. They were blonde. They had high cheeks, um, round faces. Most probably they looked like Tatars. Um, some of them looked like Russians. Some of them looked like Turks. Some of them looked like um, um, Ura Uralics, of course. Um, European type uh, people. Most of them looked uh, European like because the step was uh, closer to Europe than to Asia, let's say. So I can say that the steppe actually was inhabited by Turks and that makes actually Turks more European than Middle Eastern. So I have to finish my lecture here and wish you a good night. I hope you didn't get bored and you liked it. Good night.